That was fun. So these videos are going to be about timbales. Uh, one of the most fun and energetic and powerful uh, Latin percussion instruments you can play. So this is the introduction and I'm going to do several videos. The first one, this one's going to talk about the, uh, uh, the great players, some books to use, uh, and all the equipment. So um, I'm going to be referring to some notes I have to my right, because there's a lot to talk about. So if I look over here, please don't get distracted. So uh, I started playing timbales probably when I was about 15 years old. I would do a lot of um, Latin gigs uh, in New York, in New Jersey, uh, sometimes in Philly. I lived in, in uh, uh, New Jersey at the time, but I'd commute into New York. And then when I went to college, I moved back to the city. I'm originally from Brooklyn, from Flatbush. I went to high school in New Jersey, and then I moved back to New York, went to the Manhattan School of Music, and lived on a, a, a street called Claremont Avenue, which is right, um, it's about 122nd Street near Broadway, uh, near the subway right there. So I'd play lots of gigs, Latin gigs, uh, in Spanish Harlem, which is you know, right up there you know, in the 40s, 50s, 160s, all the way up there uh, near the George Washington Bridge sometimes. And also there were some clubs like the Red Parrot, which was an awesome salsa club uh, downtown. And I'd play there a lot on weekends. And, and a lot of months, that's how I paid my rent. So when the jazz gigs were sparse or when the cabaret law came into effect where a lot of us musicians lost our, our club gigs because they started enforcing these codes of no drums and only strings in these clubs and finally the 802 the union fixed that but it was a rough couple years so anyway i i um would play a lot of latin gigs and i'd play congas and i'd play bongos and i'd uh, play timbales so and sometimes on the gig you know we'd switch so it's different bands no big name artists at all um just just you know dance bands basically and sometimes the bands had horns. Sometimes they were merengue bands. Um, you know, just merengue all night kind of drives you nuts. Uh, but mostly, you know, the salsa gig is is a dance gig. So it's the genre is is a mambo. You play uh, you play merengue, you play cha cha cha, um, some other things mixed in. But those were the and and sometimes you play like a ballad, like a bolero or a rumba. But mostly it was mambo and merengue uh, all night. And dancing, you know, sometimes those gigs would start one in the morning and we'd go all the way to four or five in the morning. So I was living it up. I was in my early 20s and, and loving it. So the timbales were a big part of that. I played uh, mostly timbales and then a lot of times I'd play congas, uh, not as much bongos um, because mostly the bongo player in a lot of these bands, he sang, and he also played a bongo bell, which is a big salsa bell with a, with like a small stick, looks like something you used to club fish with, and he'd just be playing all night like that, okay? So it's important to know all these instruments. There's still many, many, um, let's just call them salsa gigs uh, around the country and the world. Even in Charlotte, there's a contingent of Cuban players and Puerto Rican players uh, that I've played with uh, for several years. So not as much anymore, but uh, when I first moved here, I was playing all the time. So it's a very valuable thing to learn for gigging, okay? Uh, so I highly recommend it. It's also great if you play a lot of Latin drum, drum set, it's exactly the same thing. You're just changing the surfaces you're playing on. Timbales instead of drums and cowbells, which you would obviously use on your drum set, okay? So some of my favorite timbali players um, that I grew up listening to, uh, they were uh, obviously not from the United States. Some came here, others were in Cuba. So um, I'll bring this over here and just to make sure I get the pronunciations right so no one makes fun of me. But um, Guillermo Barreto was the first guy I would hear 
on like uh, Stan Kenton records from the 60s. Uh, Nat King Cole, I think he even played with. And he played with a lot of um, uh, older artists back then. Uh, played a lot of timbales, okay? So I, I heard him on some records. I actually saw some live things. It was pretty cool, but pretty simple playing uh, compared to today's standards. And then I discovered um, Jose Luis Quintana, um, better known as Chanquito. He's the amazing, legendary timbali percussionist uh, from Cuba. Uh, he played, of course, with Los Van Van, one of the founders. He invented Sanga, which is a rhythm. A lot of you guys know it's kind of like funk. Uh, well, let's just say generically funk Latin music. It's great. If you listen to Michelle Camilo, Paquito de Rivera, a lot of that stuff is Sango, okay? Uh, Arturo Sandoval, they use those rhythms. And they came from Chanquito. Um, another guy uh, who obviously everybody knows, he was kind of the Gene Krupa or the Buddy Rich of the Timbales, was Tito Puente. Great player, great musician. I've never met, I never met him personally, but uh, I went to see him as much as I could uh, in New York, and he would play vibraphone, and he would sing sometimes, and he'd play timbales, and he had big timbales setups with giant uh, timbales and, and regular timbales, and then timbalitos, which are small timbales. It was really just crazy. And he was a showman jumping around and, and just an incredible player and musician. Um, and then most modern um, timbali players, there's lots of them. But one guy I really like is, is Ralph Izzeri, or, or I should say Irizeri. It's hard to say for me. Uh, he plays in a band called um, Timbalea. It's a fusion group that, that uses um, uh, some traditional rhythms, but man, they are incredible. It's a mix of Latin jazz and odd times and just amazing. Another uh, record, other records you should listen to, uh, Ray, Ray Barreto's New World Spirit. That's good modern timbali playing. So those guys are amazing. And, and the music's much more complex than than a lot of the older stuff you'll hear. So those are just some of the great artists. And there's many, many more. I apologize that I'm leaving a lot of them out, OK? Um, there's some books that are out for timbales. Really, you only need one. Let me show that to you. So this is, um, hopefully you can see it. There's not a bad reflection. This is Chanquito's book. It's um, called A Master's Approach to Timbales. Um, and it's great. Really, if you go through this with the recordings, that's, you know, that's a really great start. And then you can do some transcriptions and, and study some other things. I have a lot of timbali grooves in my book. Um, show you the cover to that. So that's this book. It's a drum set book and a Latin percussion book as well. And there's about uh, 10 pages of timbali grooves that you could, and conga grooves and, and some bongo grooves that you can work on. I know a lot of you have that already. So we'll, we'll be talking about that in some other videos. I'll go over those grooves, okay? The, uh, the last book I love to use is my friend Mike Spiro's book. Um, it's called The Language of the Masters. It's not really a method book. It's more of a transcription book. So, and it comes with a recording of, of several um, Montunos, um, piano and bass, and you solo over them, and then he has transcriptions of different timbali artists and conga artists and bongos. It's fantastic. I use it with my students at the university and my private students. I highly recommend that. It's called Language of the Masters. I don't have it here. My copies are at the university, and I can't get in there now because of the virus has us all locked in and that locked out. So apologize for that. So those are some books that you should use. Um, okay, so let's talk about the setup for timbales and talk about the instruments. Uh, most timbali artists, uh, especially the ones that play all the time, mostly timbales, have their own personal setups. It's just like drum set. Okay, they'll have stuff all over the place and maybe um, you know several cymbals. What I have here is the basic setup that I used uh, and have been using for the past, you know. 30 something years when I start playing. So we'll just work with that and I'll show you some different kinds of timbales. So the timbales uh, originated uh, from, believe it or not, uh, timpani. Uh, that's why they're timbales. And in French, 
it's timbales. So if you see uh, timbales on a piece of music in French, it, like Debussy, it would mean timpani, okay? But but not not these, all right? So uh, they're metal shells just like timpani, but they don't have a bottom where timpani rounds out on the bottom. Uh, these do not. They're open, kind of like a concert tom. They're, they're almost always made of metal, although some companies like Doc Sweeney are now making them out of wood, which is pretty interesting. But the, the characteristic sound of a timbali is very high and ringing, like any kind of metal drum would be. Okay, So there's different metals they use for timbales. This, this is steel. And by the way, these are JCR timbales. Uh, they're fantastic. JCR was a company in the uh, Bronx in New York. Uh, an amazing artisan, Cali Rivera, uh, would make the cowbells that what are here, really the best cowbells ever made. And he made kungas and he made bongos, all of which I have, and he made timbales, of which I have. So I pretty much bought everything he made because he was such an artist. And his instruments have such an authentic sound. Uh, they were terrific. Unfortunately, he passed away, I think it was 2017. Um, and, and I know everybody really misses him and his products because they've gone out of business. So if you get your hand on a JCR cowbell or timbales, do it. They're just fantastic. And that's what I play. I also have some other sets of timbales. I have some LP brass timbales, and they're good. I have some minor black timbales. They're good. Uh, not as good as these, in my opinion, but they're fine. Uh, I also have some old Gretsch timbales. And this is what I um, played on. These are round badge. And I don't know if any, any of you know that these actually existed, but this is what I played on uh, a long time in New York. So they're very beat up. And they have Ludwig mounts that I put on there. The old mount uh, wore out. Because <laughs> these were actually made in the 40s, I think. Maybe the 50s, but I think the 40s. So they're kind of torn up. But they are fantastic drums. All right. Different sounding, and I'll, I'll compare them with other stuff. So the sizes of these drums are 14 and 13. That's the Gretsch brass timbales. Now, the sizes of these drums, which is the most common size, are 15 and 14. I recommend those sizes, especially the 15, which gives you this low end. And that low end is important because you catch a cymbal. So you want to reinforce that like a kick drum on some of the kicks. So you'll hear timbali artists do that. And this drum here is the uh, 14. Okay, so that's the high drum. Now, these in um, Cuban culture, these are called the hembra, the humbra, and the macho. So the hembra is the female, the macho is the male. Uh, it's interesting in that culture that they, they use, they describe their drums by the characteristics. So the hembra, the female, is warm and and big and you know nice and warm sounding. That's all I can say. Okay. And the macho is aggressive, okay, and pointed and sharp like the male sound. All right. So that's that's just an interesting thing about the culture. So it goes for bongos too, that, that the hembra and the macho. So uh, just keep that in mind. So the, the uh, hembra, the large drum set up on your left, if you're a right hand player, if you're left hand, you could switch them. And the macho, the small drum is set up on your right. Okay. And they should be roughly around waist high. These are a little higher so you could see them. And I can get most of my head in the videos. I know sometimes it gets cut off because uh, of my, the way my camera is. So uh, I've raised them a little bit higher. But usually they're about, you know, belt level is the thing. You can also sit when you play the timbales and play a kick drum or uh, play cowbells. And there's a video that I posted on YouTube of a piece of mine called uh, Till the Cows Come Home. Tap Space publishes it. You can check that out. Where I'm sitting and I'm playing a bunch of percussion with my feet and playing timbales. So that's totally viable and I do it sometimes. Now, the cowbells, which are mounted over the timbales, okay, uh, they're different sizes and different pitches. So this drum, th this cowbell right here, that's fairly high pitched or the middle pitch. That's a timbale cowbell, okay? I have another one here I can show it to you. 
These are JCR bells, all right? So you see it's, that's called the mouth, and that's called the body of the bell. Hopefully you can see that, okay? And these things will rust and all that. That's just good. Leave it. Don't clean them. It's part of the character, okay? You can take some WD-40, my favorite, and uh, rub them in there, and that'll keep them from rusting too bad. But that doesn't bother me. It just, I think it, it looks good, you know? So go ahead and leave the rust. Don't worry about it. Okay, and that's the bottom. The top or the bottom, it doesn't really matter too much. They can sound a little different, so you want to experiment, but I just have the JCR sticker on the top. And these things have been used on hundreds of gigs. That's why they're kind of beat up, but they don't ever break. I've never had a JCR cowbell break. I've had LPs break, Minos break, um, Pearls break. So, you know, that says a lot, okay? The welds are super strong. And the mount is actually connected to the bell. And these don't strip out either because, um, you know, he used really large threads, as you see, hopefully here. So they don't, I've never had one strip out either, and I tighten them down. Okay? So it's a good, great bell. So that's a timbali bell. It, it fans out. It's not wide like a bongo bell. All right? So then... We have um, this right here, this bell. I'm not going to take it off. I call this a salsa bell. It's just a very low-pitched bell. So, But interesting on these JCR bells, when you play them on the body of the bell, they're very high-pitched. And they ring like no other cowbell. And here's the timbali bell. Very musical, very melodic, just beautiful. This little guy here is called a cha-cha bell. It can be used for playing cha-cha or anything else, so. Okay, and this guy here is a clave bell. I think this is made by LP. Um, used this for playing clave, so. We'll talk about the clave in a minute here. So uh, that's that's very handy. Now you can also use a wood block like that. Uh, that's an LP. Everybody's seen these. I do not recommend using a regular wooden wood block because you will break it. In the heat of passion and battle, when you're playing, you're going to lay into that thing and probably break it. So the plastic ones are fantastic. And when these these came out. Uh, I remember they came out, you know, like in the 80s, maybe maybe the 90s. Uh, I can't remember the exact time, but everybody bought them because they were tired of breaking their wood blocks, okay? And there's lots of sizes and lots of companies. All the drum companies make these, and they're great. So you can use that too, all right? Uh, I just like this metal one because it pierces. Now, you may notice some extraneous noise that I get uh, from playing these. kind of ring off each other so one thing you might want to do is set up some bells hopefully you can have a choice of which ones and make sure they sound really pretty together so uh, I should mention one guy um, Calixo um, sorry <laughs> I'll do it again uh, Calixto Oviedo, uh, I hope I'm saying that right, but the timbali player from NG La Banda, which was a, a band back in the 80s um, and through the 90s, uh, this guy started using all these cowbells. I got to see them uh, on tour, and I'd never seen a guy use so many cowbells. He had a lot of them, and he was playing the most melodic stuff, like, you know. just had a really just great technique and it really opened my eyes to that kind of thing so uh, he's a guy you should check out uh, with NG La Banda okay good so those are the bells and again the extraneous noise is going to be there when you hit a timbali 
the drum's going to ring. Nothing you can do. Now, one thing you can do is work with your tuning. So I like to tune the, my timbales in either fifths or fourths. Uh, everybody's got a different thing. Some people tune them in as wide as minor sixths. Uh, I wouldn't go any smaller than a fourth, you know, like a third. It's too close. The, again, the low drum needs to be low enough so you can catch figures. And the high drum needs to be high enough so you can uh, have a nice rim shot. So that's important. Okay, so right here... One thing I do is tune my drums to my cowbells, same kind of interval, so. So you hear this very melodic, right? So when you play them together, they sound pretty. And that's something you want to do. So it's not too dissonant, OK? Uh, something just to think about. Good. There's also other kinds of timbales. Uh, there's timbalitos. I'll show you a pair of those in another video. There's also these really cool little drum set timbales they make now, which are tiny. I mean, like six inches, eight inches. You can put those anywhere. Uh, a lot of drummers use those now. Um, and they're really cool, too. They're not going to be as big sounding as these, obviously. OK? All right. So let's uh, turn pages here and just make sure I cover everything. Good. So uh, sticks. So these are timbali sticks. Timbali sticks don't have a bead. They're just wooden dowels. Uh, by the way, you can go out to Home Depot or Lowe's uh, and buy dowels. The only thing is you want to sand the tips you know, the edges, so they don't, because their dowels are cut straight through, and they're not rounded on the ends, and they'll put some dents in your heads, okay? Especially calf heads. If you use those, be very careful, because you will break that calf head. So the dowel needs to be rounded um, on the end. The, the timbali sticks I like the best are these Alex Acuna LP. They're the best mix of weight and length. There's many other kinds of timbali sticks. These are some really little ones. I'll show you the difference. I don't know who makes these. I have a lot of these. They're generic. They break easier, but they are higher pitched versus. So the moral of this is the, hot, the thinner and lighter the stick, the higher the pitch. So if you play. versus this. OK, so that's a bigger sound. Also feels more secure. But if you have to play light, uh, you can use the thinner sticks. Sometimes when I'm playing rumbas or boleros, slow stuff, I'll use the thinner sticks because it's a lighter music. OK, so that's what I use. You can use whatever you want. But um, Alex Acuna, these are called the Conquistador. Uh, Vic Firth makes them, okay? Now, the symbol that I use here, and I have two of these different sizes. This is a Sabian uh, El Sabor, and I am not a Sabian endorser, okay? But um, uh, this is a great Latin symbol. It's fantastic. It's got a huge bell. can't miss and it's got great crash qualities it also sounds good if you just ride on it so it's just a, it's a wonderful symbol okay I totally recommend it and they make a small one too that's really good sometimes I use one here one there like a drum set all right so you can Definitely do that. So that's the symbol that I use uh, for timbales. All right. Um, 
I think I covered everything I wanted to do as far as that goes. Uh, you, you might want to notice that the way I have my bell set up, the timbali bell is facing my right out. The salsa bell or the big low bell is facing this way, okay, towards my left and right over the hembra, the large drum. The cha-cha bell is to my left and a little over the salsa bell, if you can see that. And the clave bell is out so I could reach over. It's kind of a balancing act. You have to use the setup that's good for you. So I know I, I wrote that down to talk about that. Okay, so the next thing I'd like to talk about briefly is the clave rhythm. Not the instrument, the rhythm. And there's lots and lots of great videos on YouTube uh, dealing with the clave, so you might want to look at those as well. So originally, the clave was an African clave, so it was in 6-8. So if we have eighth notes here, so that was a 6-8 clave. My left hand on this cha-cha bell was playing the clave. My right hand was playing eighth notes, so you can hear where the counts are. Now, uh, a lot of the rhythms like mambo, uh, many other rhythms, dance rhythms, um, use a straight version of clave. So there's two kinds of claves. There's a sun clave, and then there's a rumba clave. There's only one difference between the two, and that's the last eighth note of one of the cells, or measures, in Cuba they call them cells, uh, is displaced uh, to the eighth note instead of the quarter note. So a sun clave, which is the simpler of the two, and I'm, you're probably looking at this page of music now, and you can see it on, um, on the video. It's the first rhythm on the top of that page. Number one is the sun clave 3-2, which means there's three beats or hits in that first bar and two hits in the second bar or cell, as they call it. So I'm going to play in cut time. So I'm going to play half notes on this clave bell, and I'm going to play the sun clave 3-2 with my left hand. Here we go. One, two, one. Okay, so that's the sun clave, 3-2. Now, if I play the sun clave, 2-3, all that means is the first bar gets two hits, and the second bar, or cell, gets three hits. And that sounds like this. One, two, one, two, one. So that's how that works. Then there's also a rumba clave, okay? Now the difference here is that the last, what was the last beat of the three part goes to the last eighth note of that bar. So you're looking at it right now, so that's clear in my description. So here's the rumba clave, three, two. One, two, one. So that's the 3-2 rumba clave. And here's the 2-3 rumba clave. One, two, one, two. All right. So you might say, well, why is this important? <laughs> Well, it is important because all of the horn arrangements, the hits, the way the tune feels is based on which side of the clave you're on. So if you play the wrong clave, it's going to sound really funny. It's like feeling jazz on one and three instead of two and four. So that's something you really need to learn, and, and eventually you'll feel it naturally. So with that clave comes a rhythm called the cascara, or the cascara, as a lot of people pronounce it. And a word on that, pronunciations 
I've played with lots and lots of um, uh, musicians in lots of different Latin bands. People pronounce things different. Don't worry so much about that. Sometimes people get into arguments about it. Just smile, give them the thumbs up, and, and it'll be fine, okay? So don't go there. So the Cascara uh, is a rhythm that's played a lot of times on the side of the timbali. Sometimes it's called the palito pattern on the shell. So that rhythm is this. And uh, I'll post this on the, um, so you'll be looking at this hopefully right now. So here we go. Here's the Cascara. I'll play the, the um, cut time beat on this cha-cha bell. So that is a 3-2 Cascara with my right hand, all right, playing on the side of the timbali. We'll try to show you some close-ups. Close so if I take that top of the page and I play the 3-2 rumba clave, over that it sounds like this. One, two, one, two. If I play the 2-3 rumba clave, it sounds like this. And so on. You can also play the sun clave. 3-2 sounds like this. Okay, and the two three sounds like this. All right, so that kiss kara acts, um, it's layered over that clave, and that's a very important rhythm. Now you can play several variations of that, uh, feel free to do that, but it's kind of like the jazz swing rhythm, you know, ding, 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 where you can play variations of it, but you got to know that that's the mother rhythm. Everything comes back to that rhythm. It's very, very, very important that you learn it. And it's, it's coordination-wise, it's very tricky. In one of these videos coming up, probably part three, I'll show you how to practice that uh, so you can play anything under it, all right? It also works uh, for a lot of different grooves, and uh, in one of the videos, we'll show you lots of variations of mambo. So that's, that's a very important thing, clave, kiskara, how they work together. Uh, if you search that on the internet or on YouTube, again, I'd watch as many videos as possible because everybody's going to have a different approach to how they teach it, but you need to know these rhythms. Now, the last thing I want to talk about today is formula. In other words, formula in tunes, uh, Latin tunes, mainly dance tunes, salsa tunes, of where you're going to play what, when. So this is a basic formula for dance tunes using mambo. Normally, the tune will have an intro, OK? And that could be on the bell of the cymbal. So you'd play. Or even on the cowbell. All right? or even on the, uh, on the side of the timbali. So those are my three variations of what we're going to work with, and those could all happen in the intro. So that's up to you. But when we get to the verse of the tune, what you want to do is just go all shell. Maybe left hand clave, maybe, but one of the things I normally do is play the Keskara or the Palito pattern with my right hand, and I'll fill in with my left hand. Many timbali players do this. So.
So you see there I went to the uh, clave, or you can go to the side of the, the, uh, the drums, okay, the palito pad. Now, then when the chorus hits, you want to go for the cowbell, all right? So usually there's background vocals, this horn hits, it's heavier, it's louder. So that would sound like this. So that would be for the chorus. A lot of times the bongo player is playing a salsa bell with a big, you know, a little club. Looks like something you used to hit the fish when you get it in the boat. So he's going doom, 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 doom. So he's playing chord notes, and that sounds like this. So if he's not doing that, you can go ahead and play that. Uh, a lot of times uh, the bongo player will be singing background or sometimes even playing wiro, but the music needs that. So you can play it with your foot, you can play it with your left hand, you know, you have options. Uh, but that needs to be there. That quarter note, doom, 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 pulse is very, very important. Then usually a horn solo will break out, and that's when you want to use your cymbal, the bell of the cymbal. So. <laughs> there I was playing some imaginary hits that horns might be doing and reinforcing them with my left hand on the hembra on the the large 15 inch timbali okay so uh, that's the formula so again verses palito pattern choruses bells solo cymbal and usually the tunes ride out so you could do a mix of the two or cymbal bell but the so the more powerful the tune gets the more intense and exciting you want to ramp up with different parts of the timbali kit. That's extremely important. Okay, so that'll do it for this, um, this particular video, and we're going to do several of these. The next one will deal with grooves from my book. Uh, we'll talk about rhythms such as Danzon, which uses a rhythm called a becchetto, and you have a nico, so which is really a seven stroke roll. So one, two. All right, I'm sure you've all heard that used in cha-cha-cha and Danzon. So these are all rhythms you need to know if you're going to be gigging. So we'll go over several of those rhythms, and um, uh, I'm sure you'll have lots of questions, but I'm always here to answer them. So thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.